I was looking through piles of notes and things because I didn't know, and I never know quite how long I can stay up vertical. And uh, because of, of ill health, that's sometimes I just get so tired I just collapse, but I'm all right tonight. So I looked up all sorts of things, and one thing I found in a new book, and a good book actually, um, on part of the Sufi path, was uh, this is a, uh, an American who lives in Edinburgh who is involved with the Sufis, and I knew his teacher, I've never met him, but I knew his teacher, and I knew his teacher's teacher. And I've just seen this man's book, I'm rather excited about it. It's not quite our way we look at it, but that doesn't matter. We all look at it differently. But he said that in this, one of the things he said in the introduction, he said, this is a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thought, what do you mean by that? <laughs> he said, because people who get to a living school have probably hit rock bottom if they find a real school. And I consider this absolutely true. Because um, that's why so few stay in this particular school. Because so many people are guru hunting, spiritual searching, all these things. And it's only when you stop do you find a living school. This is the paradox. You may not think you've stopped. You may think you're coming here and you're still looking. But under the rules and laws of kismet or divine destiny, it's when you actually stop that you meet up with living teaching, which is always invisible. Um, if you meet any people, all this bunch here from ten nationalities, you, they don't. Uh, they look pretty normal. I mean, they are. I mean, there's doctors here, even the dentist, uh, <laughs> psychologists, professional, endless therapists of varying sorts, uh, musicians. Businessmen, architects, bakers. Um, one of the only students I've had who passed the five and a half year apprenticeship I give on geomancy, which is one thing I am professional at, which is a five and a half year apprenticeship to anybody. This is not feng shui, which I call Chinese interior decorating. <laughs> it's a long, very intense training, which is actually quite dangerous. And um, so I don't. If anybody take, I take anybody on, it is a long training. So we even got professional one of those. We got all sorts of weird, wonderful people. Authors, uh, several. And yet the, what happens, oh, professional chefs, is that what you learn from the essence of Sufi teachings, which is the title of the, of the seminar and the weekend, can be applied, obviously, to anything. But it cannot be applied if you have a label. That is the first thing I want to say to all of the English people here. I am known as a Sufi teacher by people. That is their problem. It is not my problem. Because anybody who is really involved with this would never say they were a Sufi. And that is as simple and basic as that. But it makes a problem for them, not for me. Well, sometimes for me. I've nearly uh, lost my life several times because of it, uh, labels, literally. And uh, again, I'm addressing very much this evening to the English. Um, I've been physically attacked three times uh, under very dangerous circumstances because of labels. And um, my life has been saved, one by a, a Moroccan Muslim, and once, um, oh well, various people purely because of labels. So you don't want to ever, ever have a label. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're traveling, and we are all traveling people inside, if we are travelers, obviously we don't want to lose our suitcase. To that extent, you need a label until you don't have a suitcase, so you don't need a label. And I have happily reached the point that I can fit everything I own into one suitcase now which um, is a great relief, actually. It's not that I intended it that way, it just happened to be that way. Whatever I was attached to was removed, I suppose. So I can actually travel with one suitcase or less. <coughs> so I just want to make this quite clear for everybody. If they think I'm going to teach Sufism, there's no ism in it. 
I will explain little by little, I hope, what the inner teachings are. And I'm going to just throw a few ideas at you. Now, do please forgive me, all you people from Europe. All of you have heard me say many of these things many times, but there's still only the present moment, so listen again. For example, I brought into the picture of the school, because I pop in little things every now and again, something which absolutely infuriates people who have no understanding of what the Sufis are really about, and yet they say they have. And this was actually published by Idris Shah, who was wrote, or his stable of uh, publisher wrote, I think, 18 books. And his first books were the ones that really set England alight, and then the States. He came to England first because he lived in England. The first book was called The Sufis, and the second one was called The Way of the Sufis. And then he wrote a lot of others. And now his brother, Omar Ali Shah, runs a very large school. And I use the word school consciously because all these are schools of learning, otherwise there's no purpose. We come to learn, and it's never, never ending process. Whatever happens, it never ends, it just goes on beautifully forever. But this would, and did infuriate, I did it to infuriate a little bit, to wake up some of the uh, people who, actually, who really came from a Middle Eastern background, because you won't hear this said much in Orthodox Islam um, or expressed. Although anybody who knows anything about Sufism needs to know, needs to know the meaning of Christ and Jesus, Isa, and Ruh Allah, the Spirit of God, needs to know, just as we, with a Christian background, need to know the meaning of Islam, which means surrender or submission. Very few people know anything about it at all in England, except for the Muslims. And we need to know, and particularly in the light of the current situation, we need to know, and this is something I'm passionate about. I learned about Christianity, I mean, not the form, the essence, by, through Islam. I learned about the meaning of Christ through reading the Quran every day for 30 years. I learned about the meaning of the Virgin Mary, both on about seven levels through the Quran. I'm not an Orthodox anything. I never learned anything from Christianity because they hardly ever mention it anyway. So it's very easy. One of the meanings, all of you, for the word Sufism is, well, the meaning in Arabic is tasawuf. It means the path of return. The path of return. That means us accepting, as one of the great sheikhs I've ever met, met Sheikh Fadallah once said, we are all further away from the truth than we have ever been. That is why you're here. How about that? It's because we have enough humility to know that we're so far away, and yet it's so close that we go on the path of return. And so we learn, as we do, the whole mystical beauty and wonder and excitement of what's called the Fushus al Kam, which is the wisdom of the prophets, which is all the 27 major and all the other minor, the wisdom of God, of Allah, in all the prophets expressed from Adam, the first man, right to the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings, who's called the seal of the line of prophethood. So there won't be another prophet after that. The Sufi masters obviously come after the prophet. So this is part of this, this wonderful excitement. So when I bring in Jesus, I always do this, but I'm bringing it more and more and more because um, it takes time, particularly when you've got, in Switzerland, I suppose, roughly the students of the school, I think is it about 50-50 Catholic, is it? Or more Catholic? Well, it's 50-50 Catholic. And I normally attract more Catholics than Protestants. Why? Because of the Church of England, for example, we forgot that Mary, Virgin Mary ever existed, I think, and um, got cut out by Henry VIII. So. And in Hazrat i Maryam, Mary in our tradition is, is, of course, one of the prophets. And the, you know, it's, it's the wonder of it all. Anyway, I just want to read you a little something, but I want to intellectually give you a little something just to 
bring it into the moment. And this is from Idris Shah, Notes on the History of the Sufis. The connection between the ancient practical philosophies and the present ones is seen to have been based, seen, witnessed, shaheed, witnessed, upon the higher level unity of knowledge. I'm going to repeat that. Based upon the higher level unity of knowledge. Will you get that into your inter notebook, please? Now, what is a higher level unity of knowledge? You cannot understand this with the intellect. Anything I'm saying, you can't. It's impossible. You cannot understand it with the senses. We have to go far beyond that. You cannot understand with the senses, nor with the rabbiting mind. But if you can make the senses your friends and not be limited by them, then time is on your side. Can I make that clear point to all my new friends? Make the senses your friends and time will be on your side at last. Otherwise it's not, is it? But it is on your side. And that is why a definition, one of the definitions of a Sufi, he or she is called the son, S-O-N, of the moment. The son of the moment. So the higher level unity of knowledge is a continuously evolving, unfolding body of knowledge, which is never the same twice, because God never manifests himself twice. It's impossible. All right? So it's a continuously beautiful unfoldment through love, the first cause, of knowledge. Now that higher unity knowledge is in the essence of Sufi teachings, yes. Are all those schools who say they're Sufi, Sufi? I'm not going to say, since Russ is here. <laughs> Possibly not, right? But that's okay. People find their own level sooner or later, whatever. Um, it is a saying, all dervishes are Sufis, but not all Sufis are dervishes. Sufi, the Sufi way, again just interject, is nothing whatsoever with people whirling about. The Mevlevi, we are Mevlevi, but the Mevlevi may do, but it's our business. But now, in England, as from three months ago, wait for this one, <laughs> you've been with me for so long, they have three-day whirling workshops traveling around England. It's not even on television. And it is run by an orthodox Muslim sheikh who is working for another very powerful one I know, orthodox Muslim sheikh, which is very attractive to see people whirling about, but you can't whirl, whatever you call it, in three days. Our training is a thousand and one days before you start, and then it's twelve years. So the higher body of knowledge may or may not be involved with what you may see of people, for example, turning. We call it turning, not whirling. It may or may not be. The higher bit of knowledge may or may not be involved with people in universities or whatever. It may be involved with chefs. But it is only attractive attractive to those people who want only one thing and that is truth for the sake of truth and not for themselves this is incredibly important for you all to get I only meet you perhaps once a year the students to get it back in your things if you do anything for yourself you will land up going in the wrong direction because in reality you do not exist so we will come to that point because this is the path of non-existence. So who would want to go into the Sufi path if it's the path of non-existence? Hey, what's the point of this? I don't want to go into that. Right? Well, right, what about AA? When they reach rock bottom, I've been to that one too, when you reach rock bottom with any of those things, including alcohol, um, then you are able to accept a higher will or authority with, the, say, the 12-step program. There's two people I know at least in this room on it. So it's just this attitude we have. So when I 
this higher being body of knowledge does not mean to say everybody in AA is, has it, no. And it doesn't mean to say that everybody who appears to be spiritual is anything to do with it. it. Often they're not. And we all know that some of the wisest people we meet may uh, look very wise and, and uh, sit in quiet corners and, and give wisdom talks, but doesn't mean to say they are part of that higher unity of knowledge. It doesn't mean. How do you find out? You wouldn't be here, any of you, if you hadn't got that spark of pure intellect, pure light within you, which knows. Otherwise you wouldn't be here, or you'd leave. When I was last in New York, I think 40% or something left in the first 10 minutes. Um, well, it's quite normal. Um, I actually, no, that was, no, it wasn't so bad, was it? No. I opened that talk up because New York is New York. And because I'm known by my books, means they don't know anything about me at all. Absolutely nicks, do they? How can you know somebody from their books? You will only get your opinion of them from the echo chamber of your own hearts, but you won't know them because if they're real, they don't exist. They only appear to exist. So I started off having one look at 300 people in the room in Manhattan and said, you know, and everybody's looking excited because the books are very famous in the States. <laughs> and I said, for those of you who believe in reincarnation, please remember that is your problem. It is not mine. That was look absolute horror. One of their sacred cows had kicked the bucket or been turned into spiritual hamburgers. <laughs> but they got them something to wake them up. Anyway, it goes on. This, I want you to remember this does exist. This body of knowledge of which some of us are consciously participating in, it has always existed. It always will. So I will go back to this. Based upon the higher level unity of knowledge, not upon appearances. This explains why the Muslim Rumi, now nearly everybody's heard of Rumi. Unfortunately, most people turn it into what I call rheumatism, right? <laughs> because it is, they get stuck in it. It's very nice poetry, and Coleman Barks, the biggest translator, is one of my closest friends or transliterator. But it is true that people get so hung up, they think that is the only thing. And I have said to many people, again to the English, you read Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, right? I have said this in the States and horrified people because they think the only Mevlana, right, is Rumi. Well, we have one, don't we, at Susan? Frequently, we have another one, frequently comes to Santa Fe. Right? You know the one who sells, sells those badges? You know the one with the long beard. Because Mevlana means ma a prof or man of letters in Persian. But they've turned it in the West into the word Lord. This is not right. Rumi was a great poet and reached union, but he's not. there is only one absolute being. Only one absolute being. Represented and represented. <clears throat> so that is why it says Rumi has Christian, Zoroastrian, and other disciples. When he died, there was a mile long, apparently, queue to go past his coffin, and the Christians came, even the Buddhists came. Because he'd reached that point, of which I won't use Arabic words, but there's universal knowledge. That body of knowledge, knowledge anchors love. Don't ever forget that. That is why every living school insists on study. And I will explain what study is tomorrow to you all. It is an intellectual claptrap. It means working on oneself with sufficient passion and love, marakaba concentration of a certain sort, not intellectual, and applying the refined energy in one's own being transformed alchemically into light upon the page of a sacred document in order to extract the essence of the teaching in your own language. That means there are in this room 76 different languages because your own language is your own and nobody else's. 
Always remember this. People criticize me, Orthodox Muslims, often. They say a, a Sufi prays five times a day. A dervish never stops. But I'm frequently criticized by the Orthodox Christians also. And Jews. In fact, I don't know who doesn't criticize me, but that's all right. Somebody has to be criticized. But I'm often criticized by saying you cannot understand the names of God, which is part of the school, unless you can pronounce Arabic. Well, they're correct. You must be right, we say. Because that is their reality. That is their reality, in which case you can't deny it. You cannot deny that. But the reality of it is maybe not that. Does it mean to say, because I don't speak Arabic, that I cannot know the meaning of the essence of the names of God or any of you? But it is their reality, so you cannot judge them. I've done that. And it comes back rebounding in one's face. It is not necessary for those who are in that body of knowledge which anchors love, the love of God as the first cause. That's why you can speak to anybody in their own language. And why my teacher, before he sent me away in 1973, that's for your English friends here, why I left England in 1973, because I was sent away, that's why. People were getting too identified to me in the 1970s, late 60s. We had a very big center in Gloucestershire. And there was only one way to get rid of me, throw me out. <laughs> so I was given a one I, mean, I went on a one-way ticket, one guitar and two suitcases to Vancouver and I didn't know a living soul in September 1973 but if you have a teacher you do what you're told I'm afraid at a certain level and I knew it must be right anyway but I'm going back to this thing I had to adapt myself for example every time I crossed the border from Canada into the States to change language because they're two entirely different races completely and utterly and it's also for the west of Canada and the east and yet I had to as Bulent his real name was Bulent, not Hamid. He said to me again and again, you have to invent a new language. But he would not say what it was. The language is to awaken the knowledge in your souls. He, one of the first things of the tradition, he who knows himself knows his Lord. He who knows himself knows his Lord. Ibn Arabic. Right. So, have you got that? Why is this? There's not room for two. One's got to go. There's not room for two. Thank you. I saw a few old students waking up at that point. Hi. Very good. I need to get a little ahas, right? Why the great Sufi invisible teacher, Hida, is said to be a Jew. How about that? Hida, in the Celtic tradition, is known as the Green Man. There's even pubs called the Green Man. Because it is, he is known throughout the world, the Western world, of course, particularly, as the guide of the Sufis, or the traveling people, or helper. And he appears in physical form. And he often appears in green. And so he's called the Green Man, or Hida. Um, we know from the Bible, um, he appeared in Elijah, for example. And who... Now let's ask the students, come along, because I'm you're in for it this week. I've got you for a whole week. <laughs> in my country. <laughs> in in the Christian period, who manifested as Hida? Come on, come on. You're in real trouble this week, I want you. St. George. No. Saint well yes, George could have not St. Francis then. No. John. John. Of course. And strangely enough, when we had this huge school in Switzerland, most of these attended it, for four years we had this vast place. And what was the name of the house? Johanneshof, John's house, which I hadn't noticed when we took it over. But anyway, to say this to an Orthodox Muslim, that Hida was a Jew, is quite a, a, a striking blow, um, if one doesn't know. But it's only those in this body of knowledge and I say to all of you none of you feel not worthy because if you don't feel if you feel not worthy I shall tread on your toes because you wouldn't be here unless you could understand right right 
which you won't understand with the mind. You'll hear it. You'll hear it. Here's a little story for you. If you, or when, you want to really do something to be of service and not do it for yourselves, which we all do, it is true that the good Lord, that God, Allah, the universe, whatever words you want, will, if necessary, manifest exactly what you need. If you do it for yourself, he will often manifest exactly what you don't need. If you do it for what you want. We all know that. But yesterday morning, I was really in quite desperate straits. I wasn't feeling very well. And um, I thought, how am I going to get through this week? How? I just had the notice from the doctor and all this stuff. Oh, God. I won't use my language. And I was sit- standing there in my underpants, looking in the garden and the cottage, looking out of the kitchen window, saying, and... Um, what do I need? When I was thinking, how am I? Because you're the guests and I want to do the best for you. What am I going to do? Help. A lady blackbird, right, appeared. And she was just hunting about. And all of you know what a lady blackbird, you know, they wore blackbird. They put their head on one side and listen, right? Now, you're all blackbirds for a minute. But you don't have to put your head on one side. Particularly those in the car crash, right? <laughs> but... She was put, put her head on one side and was listening, then boom, donk, and picked a worm or a bug or whatever it was. And I was watching and saying, God, God is so beautiful, really. And I was, that was helping. And then she did a very strange thing. There's a dry stone wall about that tall on my right. So she sort of did a little jump and a poof and landed on the, the wall. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so she was listening and I was working out how am I going to teach you to listen and this is how it materialized I suppose as I'm sitting here how am I going to teach them to listen I mean it's no good just saying your ears are the eyes through which God hears which is true right or those are the eyes are through which God sees so you've got to do something more than that and there's this lady blackbird who does the most extraordinary performance because it's about that high She's standing there, and then she turns her head and listens. And I go into complete silence so I could listen. And then she did this strange thing. She jumped, right, all four feet, I mean, two feet of things. I mean, jumped straight onto the ground that far down and got her, her bug. She'd listened from a wall, but it, I was listening so well at that time. Now that is the body of knowledge listening. It's not me. I ask for something to help you and me. And so this material. Now then, uh, I'm going to, now, they say Pythagoras and Solomon could have been Sufi teachers. This is Idris Shah. But there was no word Sufi then, was there? Right? Right, the word Sufi, most people say, comes the word Suf, which means wool. Well, if that's what you want to believe, good. But why do you believe it? Because you read, Suf means wool, therefore Sufi. How about digging a bit deeper? I never believed, why would it be wool? Who cares? Because Sufis wore woolen robes, well, they didn't all. What does it come from? Those who know... It comes from saf, which in Arabic means pure flow and adaptable like water. So why don't you dig deeper, all of you? Because supposing you're going to have to explain yourselves, if I drop dead tomorrow morning, and you said you've been in a school for 20 years, you're going to look idiots if you can't explain yourselves in your own language, right? Dig deeper from that body of knowledge that in embryo, like the egg is in you. There are 18,000 universes, we say, in our tradition, or more. And all those and more are in you. When you come to the point of give up, give up that you are the microcosm, it'll give you up eventually. Why are you the microcosm? Because you think you're very little. So do I if I think. And if I don't think, I don't think at all, which is lovely. Thinking is stinking, as the Americans said, but figlin is for real, baby. <laughs> right? 
So what about that you might be in potential if you become completely non-existent? You're the macrocosm, but only when you're completely non-existent, although you appear existent. This is what Jesus said, exactly what he said. But we have misinterpreted it. And then it also explains why Sufis will accept some alchemists to have been Sufis, etc., etc. And then why, and this is the last bit, why indeed Jesus is said to stand, in a sense, as the head of the Sufis. Now, if you said that to an Orthodox Muslim, you could get into trouble, couldn't you? But the answer, if you know the meaning of Jesus, is of course. And I want you all to know that. I can't tell you. I can't explain it. I can only tell you it's true. And if you dig deep enough, one day, through the grace of God and nothing else, you may be granted the knowledge of that. But you won't get the knowledge of that unless you accept Muhammad in his essence and in his being as the seal of the line of the prophets. You won't get it. You can't take out one of the wedding cake of God, one piece. It is impossible to understand on the path of return otherwise. I didn't know I was going to start preaching. I didn't really mean to be preaching, but however, I'm going to read something from one of the great Sufis, and I love this one, because I fell into this so many times, you know. I, couldn't, I can't count the times I didn't fall into the, the trap. And my teacher, of course, was a very, very tough man. And he loved me falling in, I think, <laughs> until I was in such confusion. He eventually dragged me out a bit. I was looking for a funny thing about that, but I haven't got it. And I kept searching. And this is Bastami. Um, well, if you don't search, you won't find. Right? So keep searching. This is the paradox. If you don't search, why should you find? Hmm? There's a great story in our tradition about the Virgin Mary, God bless her, who, um, it's in the Quran, she was sitting under a date palm and was meditating on God is the all provider, a razak, one of the Arabic names of God. And then a voice came to her and said, what are you doing sitting under the date palm? Shake it. Until she shook the date palm, she didn't get all the food she needed. So one must not presume. This is Bistami, one of the very great Sufis. And I'm going to make it a very short evening tonight because it's, we're all very, very tired and tomorrow we'll come be a little bit more refreshed. I'll just give a few readings. Listen, is all I can say, but don't listen and think. How do you stop thinking? Well, this is what you've been studying with me for 20 years. Right? By now you should know. Get into the mother's breath. Observe, be awake, aware, and do not identify with anything whatsoever. The 717 breathing is one of the basic things of all traditions. And seven is the number of the Virgin Mary, by the way, in the tradition. And then thinking, just ignore, just say thank you. You can't fight thinking, just say thank you. But listen, listen, and don't compare. I was mistaken in four different ways. I made it my concern to remember God, to know Him, to love Him, and to seek Him. And when I came to the end, and I hope you have, I saw that He had remembered me before I ever remembered Him and that he knew me before I ever knew him. He loved me before I ever loved him. And he had sought me before ever I went looking for him. And if we can make a little pledge this week, all of us who are working together for 10 days, God help us, um, to remember this, the real questions will appear. You have got here through the grace of God. I have got here through the grace of God. We have got here through the grace of God. And that is where we are, as Ian said. And as we are here, so we might as well be here. And I'll give you another little tip. 
a man came to see me recent, like recently travelled a very long distance and it's a straight out of a Sufi book this except it happened to be here um, well why not and um, travelled tremendous distance and was very pleased with himself that he travelled such a distance and the normal Sufi story about that is the knock on the door you know and then say who is it he says it's me go away and all this stuff. but anyway this person came and I listened for him it was a very very long journey and I knew I wasn't going to get anywhere to help this person I said do you think that I'm here for you of course he did I said rubbish look at a great question I said no you were here for me I said but you're not here so go away for them come back again another day this actually happened come back every day till you are here otherwise how can I be here for you you are here for me he didn't get it so supposing you realize that in my function as a so-called teacher you're here for me I'll be here whether you see me or not but that is for the whole school you need to grow up to that level I've allowed you the other way around for nearly 20 years and I promised you we'd go up two octaves this summer if not three I've allowed you this because it's true to a certain point and I'm very grateful and as Rumi says the key to will is gratefulness not your will the one will but take it that way around and we could have some fun but have I said it to you before no why not Rumi said I was raw then I was cooked and then I was burnt so you're frizzling a bit <laughs> perhaps but I love that one uh, and I want to read you something else two ones one is the one from Rumi the key to all of this is breath why is it why is breath the secret because you won't know if you're not alive will you and breath is life and that is why any real school teaches the science of breath not the basics yes but it's, I'm not referring to yoga breath pranayama this 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 I'm talking about the body of knowledge which can be activated by the breath how the fact that we are 80% water that there is moisture on the breath there is saline on the breath and that is an electric actually an electrical um, impulse a thought form is and that gets into the breath and so on how to be an alchemist without the knowledge of breath is impossible Thus, the school, the secret of why it's still going, despite the fact I don't see people very often, is the mystical science of breath. Nothing can be real unless you are alive and conscious of that fact. Alive and conscious of that fact. You can have all the thoughts, have all the ideas, have all the uh, thing. yes, it's like this, yes, it's like that. But when you're on the breath, now Jesus walked on water, right? Do you know what it says in, in uh, our tradition? Rumi said it too. If Jesus had had even more faith, where's the Jesus of your being, the Jesus of you? Right? He wouldn't just have walked on water, he'd have walked on air. He wouldn't just have walked on water, he'd have walked on air. This is called only breath, not Christian, nor Jew, or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi, or Zen, not any religion, or cultural system. I am not from the East or the West, not of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal not composed of elements at all I do not exist I'm not an entity in this world or the next I like that don't wait for until you kick the bucket right what is the hereafter my English friends you should be able to quote it by heart most of you it's my own quote actually the hereafter is here after you know right pun pun 
Right. Well, it's true. Don't wait for life after death. Die before you die. Motto of the Sufis. And then the hereafter is here. Isn't it? Yes. If I had the wings of a dove. Right. I am not an entity in this world or the next. Did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is the placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved. I have seen the two worlds as one, and that one call to and know, first, last, outer, inner, only that breath, breathing, human being. A conscious human being is walking on the top of the 80% you're composed of, i.e., is in control of, is never subjected to the senses, but the senses are their friends. And then is on top of the breath. That is a breath-breathing, conscious human being. And Kabir, the great Sufi, said, are you looking for me? I'm in the next seat. My shoulder is against yours. You will not find me in stupas, nor in Indian shrine rooms, nor in synagogues, nor in cathedrals, not in masses, church, I mean, not kirtans, not in legs winding around your own neck. For those yoga teachers here, there's three professionals or whatever. Nor in eating nothing but vegetables. When you really look for me, you will see me instantly. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? When you really look for me, you will see me instantly. Who's looking? Who's looking? You are the eyes through which God sees, right? You will find me in the tiniest house of time. Kabir says, student, tell me, what is God? He is the breath inside the breath. He is the breath inside the breath. So those of you who I just see for the weekend and who knows may never see you again because um, I may not be in England next week. I don't mean I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I don't believe in that either. No, um, I'm a traveling man. You know, so we don't really know where uh, I am, where I'm meant to be physically. So at least I hope I can leave you with the knowledge of the mystical science of breath. And this is not methodology. The simple one you will learn tomorrow morning before I come in for the class. Uh, one of my dearest and loyalest and sweetest of friends is going to, I hope, is she? No, she's not. Well, some people will be taking it. Anyway, just to introduce you to the basic rhythm of what's called the mother's breath. It goes back to Egyptology. You can see it in the... Um, things in the what you call hieroglyphics and um, it's called the doubling of seven in the Quran there are 14 sides to that around nothing and that is why it's such a unique thing it's never been done before at the time of I just I'm diverting for a little moment but to give you interest if you stare at that you see you can stop thinking for a minute it's quite good to stare at at the time of Jesus there were 12 disciples right if you take 12 spheres, ping pong balls, golf balls, any spheres, you can put them around one sphere of the same diameter, right? All the same size. Interesting, I mean, just a point. If you cut it in a certain way, you get a tetrahedron if you're interested in secular architecture. But Anthony could tell you that one. Because uh, he's an architect and does these things. If, <laughs> if you take the time of Buddha, he had and you take six pennies around the same thing, you can get six rounds, and he had six companions. Now then, about 40 years ago, 35 years ago, I knew, I, not me, it was known, and I picked it up, shall we say, that there would come a time in, presumably in my lifetime, but not necessarily, when once we could materialize from that body of the unity of knowledge, a figure, which is that, which was 14 
of identical shapes around nothing, i.e. one point. For those that could understand, we would have moved on into the second, towards the second cycle. No, this is far beyond astrology and Aquarian ages and that stuff. We don't get into that. It's a different thing altogether from the body of knowledge, although astrology is used by some people very good indeed. Just don't ask me my birthday. It's my birthday, not yours. <laughs> I refuse to tell you my birthday. If you're interested in astrology, that's great, but it's not my business. And it's not my business what sign you're on, is it? But everybody goes around telling everybody else about their private parts, I mean their private lives. And say, oh, he's a Pisces. Oh, I never knew he was a Virgo and all that. You know. But it, it took me 30 years until that was completed. And it was completed by avid Professor Huber, Sepp Huber, who I hope you will talk to the English tomorrow. He's got a lot of knowledge behind all that. And we'd had computer people. We'd had endless, endless things. I knew what it was. But I was missing one point, and that is that each of those diamond shapes which fit into nothing, well, it had to have 12 facets, isn't that right? So I was missing Jesus. We had the right shape. And I knew that from one of my passions, which is, um, is to do with sacred geometry. I knew that, but I missed the 12. And it coincided when Sepp finally got it with a, a realization in me, although we're different bodies apparently, of a much higher level of the understanding of Christ. And then, good darn it, if my mate didn't go and get the 14 around one. And for Keith Critchlow, who is an incredible, wonderful man, I've known him for a very, very long time, a deep, deep mystic in himself, for him to say it's never been invented before. I'm going to read you a story and then we're going to wind up. This is a story from Nasruddin. Everybody's heard of Nasruddin. And you can read and read and read this. And every time it is different, isn't it? And Mas Nasruddin was the sort of clout court jester of his time. Oops. And this terrible paper. This is um, a story. And this is you or me or anything. It's about our passageway, our journey. Once upon a time, to all my English new friends, why does, it, does a story start once upon a time? Because upon a time, every moment is new. All good stories start once upon a time. You're on top of time because you're on top of the breath. And that's why most mystical writers, or whatever you call us, don't remember a word we say. And why we'll never, I'd never use a computer. Because why would I alter anything I said? It's ridiculous. I'm not going to alter anything I said. It is already said, so why alter it? You've changed the pattern of unfoldment. Once upon a time, Muller was invited to speak at the mosque in a particular village at Friday community prayers. This is normally the only time when there might be a sermon or talk, since everyone would be gathered. The village that invited Muller was widely known as the largest collection of foolish people in the region. And here we are. <laughs> and it's Friday. That's why I chose it. Right. <laughs> they sent a de delegation to Muller. Oh, Muller, wisest of the wise, we know that we're not worthy, but please come and give the sermon at our community prayers. Give us a chance. <laughs> Muller agreed and went there the next Friday. Well, some of you will be here next Friday, but it's all today. He walked to the front of the mosque after prayers and said, Does anyone know what I'm about to tell you? <laughs> no one dared answer for fear of being proved foolish. <laughs> <laughs> then, said Muller, you're all too foolish to tell. Then he walked out. <laughs> The next day, the town again sent a delegation to Muller, begging and pleading, we'll try to do better. Muller, please come again. How many of you have been through this? <laughs> One in 20 years. <laughs> the next Friday, the same thing happened. Muller walked to the front of the mosque after prayers and asked, does anyone know what I'm about to tell you? <laughs> this time, as if choreographed, everyone responded at once, yes, we know. <laughs> 
then there's no point in telling you, <laughs> said Muller, and he walked out again. <laughs> As you might guess, another day, another delegation, more bowing and scraping. Just one more chance, Muller. We promise. Again, the funny week, the same scene, the same question. And this time, half the crowd yelled out, Some of us know. <laughs> and the other half responded, And some of us don't. <laughs> so, said Muller, Let those who know tell those who don't. <laughs> and he walked out the third time. <laughs> now, I heard it told that many years later, Muller happened to be travelling again near the town of foolish people, and he noticed that it just happened to be Friday around noon. <laughs> oh, I think I'll go and see how they're getting on, said Muller to himself. <laughs> as he entered the mosque, prayers were over, but it looked as if everyone was waiting for something. He muttered to himself, oh, why not, and walked to the front. Does anyone know what I'm about to tell you, he asked. At this point, everyone in the mosque stood up and walked out, leaving Muller standing alone. <laughs> <laughs> this man, who was in Edinburgh, made this comment. That story mirrors one view of the journey of our inner self. As we begin the spiritual path, we're in denial that we even have a voice of guidance within us. Um, I would add here, when we know that we know nothing, that's the beginning of the journey. That's only the beginning, when we know we know nothing, because he, which is beyond anything, is the only knower. That's when it begins, not until. So the moment any of you who've been in the school for 20 years or less think you know anything, start again. Because you're thinking you know it. Right? And if you think you know it, you don't. So, there we are. We're waiting for someone outside to illuminate us. Then we swing to the other extreme and think we know everything. Now, I'm not going to be rude, but there is a large wave of that sweeping out of America. It's swept from India originally, he said, looking over his glasses, from a guru over there, and then it's swept to America. And um, I'm not against it, but it is swept into England now. Um, and it's sweeping about. Uh, it basically says that there's nothing to do, there's nothing to learn, we are already enlightened. And that is everywhere. Um, and there's all sorts of different people saying this. I'm not saying anything wrong with it. It is their problem. Um, <laughs> um, I'm, it is a stage, and it's a wonderful stage, and it's not unhealthy. I've been there. We've all been there, I expect. But um, somehow you reach a point. It's like this, you know, if you read all these books on near death experiences, 98% say this, they see a light at the end of the tunnel, etc. How about if I tell you that that is still duality? Die before you die. If there is a, an answer to that, it's okay, it's a step. But it's when there is no tunnel, nobody looking, and no light, then there's freedom. But um, it's no good just saying it. This is a, a gift from God, and that is, becomes a reality, a living reality. But it's, um, there's nothing wrong with this wave that's sweeping. It sweeps all over America, as we know, Susan, doesn't it? Absolutely. It's on television twice a week, three times. And um, it comes under a very large heading. I have nothing against it. It is a stage. And if it's coming to England, it's quite healthy. But in my very, and I say this humbly, if you're on your deathbed, and many of us perhaps have been nearly, is it enough? Do you then say, wow, I'm enlightened? My God, you're screaming for breath. Or you're praying, or you're what? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing, I'm not criticizing or judging it, but it is a new way. But anyway, this is, as we agree in the room, then we swing to the other extreme and think we know everything. When our inner life finally wakes up, the part of us that knows is able to speak to the part of us that doesn't know. Muller's third solution. 
Our higher guidance, I don't know, this is not my language, but I, he's very sincere. Our higher guidance is able to speak to our nafs. Nafs, this is written for Sufi aspirants. The nafs comes from a root in the fess. It, it's nafs can mean lower self, it can mean soul, it can mean self, it can also mean the fess means breath, so it's, it's a rather difficult word to use. Uh, once this happened, it's just a matter of staying on the path and allowing our hearts to continue to grow. At the end, when Muller returns, he finds that the answer to his question is absence. I like that. The small self, beyond affirmation and denial, has merged with the self of the beloved. That is probably what it means by realization. So I'm going to finish with that because it is late, it's 10 o'clock. I want to just go back to one point. We all share the same air. Remember this, all of you. Please, I say it at every talk, every time I see you, perhaps once a year when I do see you. We all share the same air. It is the easiest, the quickest thing to forget. We are all, as Gorgi has said, Cosmic apparatuses, nothing more romantic, nothing more thing. We are all cosmic apparatuses, potentially, for the transformation of subtle energies. How is this done if you're in a um, box? No. It's done because you are alive. And you treasure being alive with other people. Sometimes you are more alive than we are. I would travel to the ends of the earth when I was with my teacher. He never spoke to me half the time. Dreadful man. <laughs> In a way, I mean, he just was the best teacher because if I didn't have a question, why would we be there? So I just make him coffee for hours, or whatever it was. <clears throat> to treasure this thing that we are sharing the same air, just imagine that. Not just by this rule. Why? Because love is not limited by walls, nor any form whatsoever. When we come to share that this weekend and continuing on, we carry with us something. And the purpose of this next cycle, without any question in my, in my mind, is for those who are granted, who are granted an entry, because it's a gift, you can't achieve it. You can poke at it, this body of the knowledge of unity. You can poke at it, you can strive for it, you can try and fish for it like salmon, but you won't do any good. When you are granted an entry into this, which all of you have been anyway, you just don't know it. This is the most important thing I can leave you with. You cannot be a human being unless you are conscious, and you cannot be, fulfill your destiny, our destiny, each of us, as transformers, and unfolders, if you like it, of the everlasting truth, unless we are conscious. It is merely repetition of patterns. And once you get to the glory, once we do, and I mean, we all have, once we have this, this knowledge of life, the glory, sacredness of life, it isn't sentiment. Sentimentality, my last words, quoting Rumi, is the greatest enemy of love. Sentimentality is the greatest enemy of love. 90% of people you so -called see on the so-called spiritual path are completely obsessed with sentimentality. It means that instead of the senses being friends, there's 12 senses, not 5 or 6, there's 12 we work with. When they become friends, they become servants, they become willing servants. Once say, if we are overcome by them, we cannot reach this body of knowledge that I talk about. Thank you all for listening. I know how tired you are, and may you sleep well in the Devonshire air. Uh, and as I apologize, Jane already has, uh, if there's eight people for one shower, excellent, excellent. We're all sharing the same air. <laughs> It's like you're not camping. <laughs> it's a wonderful place to be.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.